Welcome everyone. So today we're going to be discussing the origins of life on this planet as well as the energetics of microbial metabolism. So first part of this lecture, some pretty cool stuff. Second part of this lecture, a lot of chemistry. <laughs> so I guess strap in for this, uh, this two part ride. So um, the questions we're going to try to answer for the first part where we tackled the origins of life is when did life on earth first evolve? Under what conditions? And what is our best guess to how it developed? How have environmental conditions changed over Earth's history? And how were microbes involved? And what are some of the indicators of life we can find in the geological as well as the fossil record? So let's dive in. So this is just a very nice and very handy timeline of the evolution. and then the Earth's crust cooling. So we're gonna use this as a backdrop to understand the evidence for the early life on the planet, how life developed, and how microbes were involved. Now, early Earth was definitely nothing like it was today. It was just un, uh, un, it was just an unideal place for life. There was constant bombardment of large chunks of space rocks, asteroids, comets, sometimes even small planetoids. Uh, some of the impacts were powerful enough to vaporize oceans, sterilizing Earth's surface. And if you're going to be a microbe living on a planet where there's constant bombardment, you had to survive below ground or potentially as a spore or an endospore. In addition, we have some pretty other challenging conditions of early Earth besides being constantly bombarded from outer space. These include the lack of an ozone layer. And for those of you that have never heard of the ozone layer, or maybe you just didn't know what the ozone layer is, it's in a layer of gas in our atmosphere that protects us from ultraviolet light. And you might say, well, why do I care about ultraviolet light? Well, ultraviolet light is just one of the types of radiation from the sun. And this type of radiation damages your DNA. And so if you've ever heard of skin cancer, what causes skin cancer is ultraviolet light from the sun. And ultraviolet light itself damages DNA. And there are bacteria alive nowadays, uh, in particular the bacteria from the genus Deinococcus, but in particular Deinococcus radiodurans can actually survive 1500 times the lethal UV dose that would kill a human being. So there are microbes that can survive in an ozone free environment, but the ozone layer is pretty vital to life as we know it nowadays. So in addition to the ozone layer, we had much, much more greater volcanic activity and uh, this is an in, important thing, um, not just because volcanoes are kind of cool, but uh, volcanism helps put CO2 into the atmosphere, which increases the greenhouse effect, which thus warms the planet. So uh, volcanism is bad in one sense, but also make it uh, good in the other sense. But ultimately, we can look at all these conditions. So there was there was some liquid water. There was lots of ultraviolet light. The early Earth was anaerobic, meaning there was no oxygen. Lots of asteroid strikes. There was no organic molecules, so nothing for microbes to eat. There was a lot of lightning, and there was lots of other gases, methane, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. So all these gases that we see here on the right. So the question you can ask yourself, and, and obviously the answer to this question is gonna be yes, but it's how we get to this answer of yes to this question, can you make a life out of this, is what's important for this class. So all this terribleness that we see here, how do we make life out of it? Because clearly we did. Well, there are a couple prevailing theories here. Um, these include the, the chemical theory of evolution, which we will discuss, panspermia, where life was seeded on this planet by uh, life that was existing on another planet in the solar system or potentially outside of our solar system. Uh, there's the hydrothermal vent hypothesis, which is life started down by hydrothermal vents. There's the deep hot soup hypothesis, which life started very, very deep down in the planet. And there's many, many others, including the radioactive beach hypothesis. So there's a lot of prevailing theories here. Um, so 
on the Earth. So to the sort of the start of this idea started in the 1950s, two scientists whose last names are Miller and Urey, they made what we would call a reducing atmosphere. So they took the primitive Earth, they took nitrogen, so in the form of ammonia, methane, hydrogen gas, and water. And what they did is they sparked it in a chamber. And the idea being is that all these gases plus the spark was like early Earth. And the spark was set to mimic lightning, which as I mentioned, there was lots of early on. And so what they did is they, they did this experiment, they sparked these gases, they condensed it down, and they analyzed the chemicals that came out. And what they found was actually just by spontaneously sparking these chemicals, they would actually produce some of the building blocks of life, organic or carbon-based compounds, which is really remarkable. And so again, what, what's happening here is you're taking energy and you're combining it with atmospheric gases, and you're producing the building blocks of life. You start off with aldehydes and hydrogen cyanide, and then you start to make things that are important, like urea and propionic acid. And eventually, as you keep synthesizing, you can start to create the amino acids, uh, the building box of proteins, alanine, glycine. And you can start to make other important things that are they're good for microbes to eat, such as lactic acid. So you can make very important, what we would call biomolecules or molecules that are very important to life with just spontaneous chemical reactions. Now, I mentioned this was done in the 1950s. This has been reproduced multiple times since. So this is an accurate scientific uh, uh, phenomenon, synthesizing life-based um, molecules from spontaneous chemical reactions. And the idea being is that simple organic molecules, such as the one that was in the previous slide, began to accumulate over time. So as lightning kept synthesizing more and more of this, they began to accumulate. And once you have all these important building blocks, such as amino acids and things like that, well, you start to have them accumulate. But once you have all those building blocks, you need, you need a vessel. And you need some, you need a cell, right? Even a bacteria and archaea, they have cells, right? They're not as complex as eukaryotic cells, but they certainly have cells. So the next thing we need is a vessel, a container. We need a cell. And the answer we can actually derive from, again, more of this spontaneous chemical reactions is that what we call amphiphilic molecules. And amphiphilic molecules, you'll actually kind of recognize from our talk about the cellular membrane of bacteria. They have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. And the sort of the remarkable things about these is they can, they can orient themselves spontaneously, be either in water with the, the, the hydrophobic, I'm sorry, the hydrophilic heads in the water and the hydrophobic tails facing out of the water, or they can orient themselves into what we call a micelle or a sphere. So as, when we look at asteroids and what's inside asteroids, we find amphiphilic. No acids, and we have a vessel, right, the cell. Uh, the next is just um, something to do action in the cell. And when we're thinking about how life uh, does action at the cellular level, we need proteins. And so to, we have the capacity to synthesize proteins. And so in 1964, a gentleman named Sidney Fox heated a mixture of 18 amino acids to temperatures ranging from 160 to 200 degrees, which is not unreasonable uh, for early Earth. And what he attained was stable protein-like macromolecules, which he termed proteinoids, or proteinoids, I should say. And it was kind of interesting when he cooled them off. Uh, so this is what they look like. Once you cool them off, they actually um, form what we call microspheres that actually show a very high resemblance to primitive and simple bacteria. So we could synthesize protein-like things and bacteria-like things by just heating those amino acids, which again, which those amino acids, which we can synthesize spontaneously with a little bit of chemistry. Now, <clears throat> we have, at this point in time, we have amino acids, proteins, and a primitive cell, 
the question you can, should ask yourself is what does life need besides those things? Those are three of the most important things life needs. The last thing we need is instructions, something that can be passed on from one generation to the next, something that can keep, that can keep information at the cellular level. And that answer becomes in the form of nucleic acids, our DNA and our RNA. Now, what we do know is that RNA was likely first. You can synthesize RNA. Evolution is a big thing about, about nucleic acids. They need to be able to evolve. So some in uh, what we call in vitro or in laboratory studies have shown that RNA can evolve. So RNA has all the characteristics of something that would be uh, particularly adaptable to early life. And it was likely the very first type of nucleic acid on this planet. And DNA likely came later on. Uh, DNA is much more selectively uh, stable than RNA is. Uh, so it's a much better molecule to pass on things to the next generation. But if all you have is RNA, RNA can work in a pinch. So the, the, the sort of the workflow that we've discussed thus far is we have a primitive atmosphere. And from that primitive atmosphere, we can make amino acids to make proteins or nucleotides to make RNA. And then we can synthesize a pro proto cell, something that slightly resembles a bacterial cell. And once we have that, once we have a heredity, once we have the action, and once we have a cell, that's really all life is. That's really all a bacteria is, right? All the bacteria is is just a cellular membrane and a cell wall housing DNA and proteins. That's it. And so we can make all these things spontaneously. So the panspermia theory. And this is where life on planet Earth came from somewhere else. With the idea being that the Earth was seeded from life with life from another planet, such as Mars, such as uh, outside the solar system. And the rationale behind this is that many of our other planets in the solar system, in particular Mars, likely cooled faster uh, and, used to have, and used to have liquid water. And the idea being is if you have life er evolve on Mars first, and a piece of Mars breaks off because of, say, if an asteroid, well, maybe that life got carried on that space rock all the way here to Earth. Now, those are the sort of the two big theories. Um, and at the end of the day, we don't quite know how life arose on Earth. And that's a question I will only really have, well, I don't know. We'll see how things shake up. But as of right now, all we really have is anecdotal evidence of how life came to be. And so at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how life came to be. It came to be somewhere on this planet a really long, long time ago. So we want to ask the question now, when did life develop? And how do we know when life developed? How do we know when I say life, <clears throat> life evolved billions of years ago? How do we know that? So let's talk about that. Now, it's kind of, it, it just has a sort of a, a background to this. It can be often hard to interpret the evidence of life on Earth because biology and non-biology can actually create similar products. And what, I, what do I mean that? Well, some metals can be oxidized by microbial activity, but they can also be oxidized by ultraviolet light. And so when we're trying to infer the evidence of life, we want to actually use multiple lines of evidence and see where they overlap. And so when we're trying to identify when life appeared, we can use what are called biosignatures. And these are just uh, <clears throat> pieces of evidence in the earth that uh, signature tell us that life is present. And these include cell-like formations and then chemical signatures. So let's talk about cell-like formations first. So the first one, our first biosignature is microfossils. And this is one that is a little bit mixed evidence. Um, and so microbes very much like bigger things um, can form fossils. Now fossils of microbes are formed when they die and their form is filled by minerals, very much the same way you know, if you have a dinosaur, its bones are, are fossilized by changing their bones to minerals. Um, and when we start to look at these, when we look at microbial fossils, we can start to see, um, <clears throat> you know, on the left here, we have microfossils, and on the right side, we have modern species. We can start to see a lot of similarities 
between col colonial cyanobacteria, ancient ones and modern ones, algae, old ones and modern ones, filamentous prokaryotes and modern filamentous prokaryotes. And so they do have a lot of similarity. And the earliest microfossils we see of bacteria date back to about 2 billion years ago. However, there is a big caveat here. Some of these forms can actually be created by non-biology related processes. So these fossils look cool, but it's not conclusive. There's, again, there's a lot of similarity here, right? This looks an awful lot like this, but it's not conclusive overall. However, the, the best fossilized remains of microbes that we know are actually what we call stromatolites. And as you could tell from this picture, stromatolites still exist in modern times. So we see them in the fossil record, we know they exist, so it's actually a pretty good linkages between the past and the present. Now, you might ask yourself, what the heck's a stromatolite? It, they look like rock, and they kind of are. <laughs> they kind of are just rocks at the end of the day. Now, stromatolites uh, in ancient times are just large fossilized mounds of cyanobacteria. And remember, our cyanobacteria are our photosynthetic bacteria. Now, the earliest evidence for stromatolites occurs about 3 billion years ago, so earlier than the very first bacterial microfossils. Now, these living fossils, um, again, are present um, modern times. We find them in freshwater and marine environments. And actually, we know that stromatolites, because they're cyanobacteria, likely played a key role in the generation of oxygen in our atmosphere. Because remember, early Earth's atmosphere, it was completely anaerobic, lacking oxygen. And we can physically see these in modern times and again, in ancient times. So let's go back to our timeline here. Again, this is our time, our timeline, modern times, back to the, when the Earth's crust cooled 4.6 billion years ago. We see microfossils at about 2 billion years ago, and we see stromatolites at about 3 billion years ago. So we got two lines of evidence, but let's talk about more lines of evidence, because two is clearly not enough for this complex of a process. So the next one is going to be biomolecules and metal oxidation states. So there are a couple types of molecules, and we've talked about um, these before, that we consider unique products of biological activity. And these include hopanoids. So you should remember back from our very first couple classes about structure. Hopanoids are, are steroids that are embedded in the membranes and the, and the cell walls of our bacteria, and they are only produced by bacteria. And the earliest uh, chemical traces we can see of hopanoids is about two and a half billion years ago. So that's one line of evidence. Another line of evidence is banded iron formations. And this is what, you, what I mean by a banded iron formation here. You have rock and then you have uh, oxidized iron forming here. Now, as we'll talk about in the later part of this class, are, there's a group of bacteria called chemolithotrophs. They use iron as an electron donor and oxygen as an electron scepter. So it's basically iron-based photosynthesis. Now, as, as they do this, um, as they're producing oxygen, whether it's in large amounts or small amounts, iron, it's an iron three, is produced because it reacts with oxygen. I'm sorry, iron three is, the iron three that's produced from this process of this metabolism, so you go Fe2 to Fe3, this reacts with oxygen that's created and creates iron oxides, i.e. rust, so Fe2O3. And this red is just rust. I'm sure many of you have seen rust before. I find it hard to believe no one has made it to adulthood and not seen rust, but this is what rust looks like in the, the sediment. Now, the idea being is you can actually look at red beds, and so you can, you can find red beds, which are just banded iron formations. So you can see the deep red here in the lines of iron. Um, we know we can find these about a billion years ago. And you can find them all over the world, including in this picture, which is at the Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming. Now, this is something that, can, again, it can be chemically done, but it's most commonly associated with life, just as. Um, next up, we can actually look at what's called stable isotope analysis. Now, we don't really talk about a ton about chemistry. This, is, this class is really going to be the only class we talk about chemistry, but uh, just as a refresher, if you, or as a sort of a, a note, if you have not taken chemistry, isotopes are elements that have the same number of protons and electrons, but they have different number of neutrons. And so we have carbon over here. Carbon 12 has uh, six protons and six neutrons. 
carbon-13 and carbon-14 are isotopes of carbon-12. And you'll notice that carbon-12, I'm sorry, carbon-13 and 14 each have an extra neutron relative to the one previous to them. So carbon-13 has seven neutrons and carbon-14 has eight neutrons. And so the kind of the interesting thing about these is um, you can trace them through time. You can trace isotope usage through time. Now, um, there are some radioactive isotopes out there. So if you've ever heard of like nuclear fallout, that's radioactive isotopes. And those are just unstable atoms that break down over time. Um, however, there are many types of isotopes that are stable over time. Um, and the kind of cool thing is that depending on which isotope you look at, they're actually used differentially by different organisms. And what do I mean by that? Well, carbon-13 is slightly heavier than carbon-12. Because of that, organisms that are doing photosynthesis or many other processes will prefer carbon-12 over carbon-13. Kind of a weird thing. It's slightly heavier, so thus they prefer the lighter thing. It requires less energy to do. And so the idea being in here is if you have um, you know, carbon-13 and carbon-12 CO2 and you have an enzyme that fixes CO2, the enzyme will preferentially choose carbon-12 over carbon-13, leading to carbon-13 um, being much, more, much less abundant than carbon-12. And you could do some math to calculate this. This is what goes into it. But let's, let's talk about how we um, use it. And so uh, the earliest geological evidence for life just using isotopes is uh, 3.7 billion years ago. So we're going way back in time now. Now, how do we know this? Well, we can look at an enzyme called Rubisco, um, which is the, actually the most abundant enzyme on the planet. Um, and it's evolved in the Calvin cycle, which is involved in the fixation of carbon. Now, this enzyme Rubisco strongly prefers 12 carbon over 13 carbon. And so the interesting thing about it is once an organism dies, if you're fixing 12 C, 12 carbon CO2, that carbon that you fix after you die becomes calcium 12 carbon. And so what ends up happening is because the carbon is not being fixed, the 13 CO2 is staying in the atmosphere. And so the rock where life is present is being enriched in carbon-12 and being depleted in carbon-13. So what this tells us is if we see an enrichment of carbon-12 relative to carbon-13, it means there's life present because something has to be selectively choosing the 12 over the 13. That just doesn't happen naturally with chemistry. Chemistry doesn't care. Chemistry will choose 12 and 13 equally as, amount, as, as much, but life will choose 12 over 13. So if you see a depletion of 12 relative to 13, well, you can make the assumption that life was present. In particular, autotrophic life was present. In addition, we can see this also with lithotrophs, and we'll talk about this category of organisms later, but they prefer sulfur-32 over sulfur, the, the isotope sulfur-34. Sulfur and we can look at isotopic evidence of sulfur, and it tells us that um, sulfate reduction, which is a metabolism we'll talk about later in this class, originated about 3 billion years ago. So it's actually a very, very old metabolism. So isotopic life is, puts things even older. So we're back to our timeline. We have microfossils, banded iron formations at about 2.5 billion years ago, hopanoids at about 2.7 billion years ago, stromatolites at 3 billion years ago, and then finally isotopes at about 3.7 billion years ago. And so what we can conclude from this is that based on all this evidence is that life arose somewhere between um, you know, 3.7 billion years ago and 2 billion years ago. But it's somewhere in this ballpark. It's not later. It's not older, it's somewhere in this ballpark. Now, the most accurate evidence is likely to be isotopes and hopanoids here, as well as stromatolites. So it really pushes us more towards between three and 3.7 billion years ago, just as a note. Um, but again, all our evidence points to this two, you know, 1.7 billion year time frame between isotopes and microfossils. So life is old. Now, you might be thinking, okay, life evolved, cool. That gives us humans, that gives us all the things we like. But how does life affect Earth? And this is just sort of a nice example where we have early life, early atmosphere and modern atmosphere. And you can see that life has dramatically changed our atmosphere. We have more oxygen, we have less CO2, we have less carbon monoxide, we have less methane, we have no hydrogen. So early life dramatically affected um, 
our atmosphere. And in particular, the most important part is what we would call the Great Oxygenation Event or the GOE. Now, there's abundant geological evidence that shows a rapid increase in oxygen levels around 2 billion years ago. Now, let's go back to our timeline. Oxygen is here. We're starting to see microfossils and banded iron formations. And um, our banded, as I mentioned, banded iron formations only form when oxygen is present. And oxygen itself is a biosignature of life. Without life, there is no oxygen. So when NASA searches for life on other planets, the first thing they look for is oxygen in the atmosphere. Because if oxygen is present, that means life has to be there. Because there's no other way to make oxygen in this universe. Now, how does oxygen get to the atmosphere? Well, first it gets bound to minerals. So it doesn't directly go into the atmosphere. It gets bound to our rocks first. Then once, then, then after that, it saturates the ocean. So it binds, you know, gets in the water. And then after it, it's bound to all the minerals and it saturates the water, it then is allowed to accumulate in the atmosphere. And once it starts to accumulate in the atmosphere, this resulted in a huge number of changes on the planet. And the first thing, it greatly expanded the cycling of major elements, including sulfur and nitrogen. And so we can look at this. We can look at the amount of sulfur over time. So this is four, four, gil, four billion years ago in modern times. We can see that there's very, very low sulfate over time. The great oxygenation event happens, and then bam, we see a rapid expansion of sulfur. I'm sorry, sulfate. And again, this is all due to the metabolic activity of microbes that like to use sulfur in their metabolism. And we can see the same thing for nitrogen. We see that ammonia was really prevalent early on <clears throat> when the great oxygenation event happened. Boom, and then we see expansion of nitrate. And so a brand new metabolism opens up where you convert ammonia into nitrate. <clears throat> so we can see that directly in the cycling of nutrients on this planet. And so once oxygen was present <clears throat> in high enough concentration, this resulted in the formation of an ozone layer. And as I mentioned with the ozone layer, well, that protects you from UV light. And once you can be protected from UV light, that means you actually can leave the ocean. It means you don't have to live in water. You can live on land. So that was kind of a big deal. But more importantly, oxygen encourages evolution. And how does it do this? Well, oxygen at first is toxic. And so it's toxic and it's very reactive. And so if you're going to live in a, an atmosphere that's toxic and is very reactive towards your, your own self, you have to evolve a way to cope. aerobic metabolisms. But ultimately, the presence of oxygen um, <laughs> uh, the presence of oxygen allowed for what we call endosymbiosis and eventually higher life, leading us to um, eukaryotic organisms. And so this is just a really nice uh, figure we have, um, really nice figure that we have where we see the evolution of the diversity of life. As this gets bigger, that means there's more diversity of life. And you, what you can actually see is that this is, you know, back in old times and this is newer times. You can see as oxygen starts to accumulate, the evolution of life on this planet explodes. So oxygen is a huge driving force in the evolution of life on this planet. And so in terms of um, <clears throat> putting this all together. We have all this biosignatures, fossils and iron formations, but you can see that our first evidence of protists is about 3 billion years ago. The first evolution evidence of algae is about 2 billion years ago. And our first evolution of uh, evidence of fungi is about 1 billion years ago. So these are our main sort of groups of fungi. And it's likely bacteria and archaea were evolved somewhere in this ballpark, right around when the early life started. So what the heck has happen over the past billion years? Well, environmental conditions relative to early Earth are much, much more stable. Temperature, oh, sorry about that. Microbes. 
even if you know you're thinking about protists, protists are single-celled microbes. So it all started with microorganisms, and that's an important thing. So let's summarize this first part, and then we'll move on to energetics, which is uh, again a complete 180 from what we're talking about here. Now, the summary that we want to remember is that microbes were the first things that emerged, and they emerged under very different environmental conditions that are present on modern Earth. The origins of the first life whether it's Earth or elsewhere, is still a matter of debate. We don't really know. But most evidence suggests an evolution based on chemicals and some And these microbes act to shape our planet, not just the atmosphere, but the biosphere as a whole. And so everything that we know about modern day is due to the actions of these early microorganisms. So next up on our topic, and, and it's probably going to be your least favorite lecture of the semester, it always is when we do micro, microbiology, is energetics. So the questions we're going to answer for energetics is how do microbes generate the energy to power cellular functions? What metabolic reactions are feasible and how can we predict them using thermodynamics? And what are electron transport systems and how are they used? So as you can see, three really fun questions to answer. Now, I always like to start off energetics by showing this crazy metabolic pathway for E. coli. And you could just sit here, you could zoom in on it. But the key takeaway here is that metabolism is complicated, even in a simple organism. Now imagine what your met metabolic pathway looks like inside one of your cells. It's much larger. So anyways, chemistry is, is cool. And sometimes I'm not, I'm not a big chemistry person, but life, if you're going to understand biology, whether it's human biology or microbiology, you have to understand chemistry because life is just chemistry. And it doesn't matter what it is. The motion of love is just chemistry touching something that's involved with chemistry, eating food, chemistry. So life is chemistry. Um, so if we're, gonna, if we're gonna think about life, it's governed by chemistry. So we need to understand the basic rules of chemistry to understand the metabolic capacity of microbes and what they can do and the ecology of these microbes. And so Energy and metabolism, it's going to be a hot topic for today's, but we're going to talk about them again and again and again throughout the semester, just not as in-depth as we're going to talk about them today. So it all starts with this one molecule, and you've probably heard of ATP, ATP before, adenosine triphosphate. It is the energy currency of your cell. It is an adenine bound to a sugar, a five-carbon sugar, and which is then bound to three phosphate groups. And this is the energy currency for all eukaryotic cells, and all prokaryotic cells. And the way this works is you take ATP and you dephosphorylate it. So you take off one of those phosphate bonds, converting ATP to ADP, ADP being adenosine diphosphate as opposed to adenosine triphosphate. But by liberating one of those phosphate groups, we, we generate a lot of energy. And this energy can do work. And what, what do I mean work? Well, it powers cellular and enzymatic functions. And that's, that's how it works. You take off a P and you get energy from it. But you can also reverse that reaction. So if you want to make ATP, you can combine ADP with, with a P and some energy to make ATP. But to make ATP, it requires putting in energy. Now, I'll just, just as a note, um, the energy is stored in these chemical bonds. That's So when you eat food, the food you eat has energy in it that's stored in the chemical bonds themselves. So just, just as a, a note. Now, <clears throat> when we're thinking about this uh, idea, we sort of can boil it down to a couple large groups. And we call these trophic groups. Now, the first large trophic group split we could talk about is where you get your energy or ATP from. If you're a phototroph, you get it from light. If you're a chemotroph, you get it from external molecules. In particular, you get it from organic molecules, such as sugars, fats, and proteins. So that's the first type of trophic groups we can make. So let's talk about some of these. So today, we're going to mostly focus on chemotrophy. Uh, we'll talk about phototrophs um, 
in the coming lectures. It'll be very brief. Um, I don't talk a lot about phototrophy because it's not a very exciting topic for uh, those that are interested in the medical field, but we'll talk about it very briefly. Um, and these organisms that are chemotrophic or, or have possessed the capacity for chemotrophy get their energy, i.e. produce ATP from external molecules, i.e. chemical energy. Now, the kind of cool thing about microbes is they can be very energetically powerful. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you take microbes and you put them on a compost, And upwards of 100 degrees, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which is kind of crazy. And it's not like there was a fire or something under there. This is just all the metabolic activity of microbes. And the kind of cool thing about this, and not really related to what we're talking about today, but it kills weeds and plants and plant diseases. Um, but it can limit the ability to suppress diseases in the soils as well and because it can kill beneficial bacteria underneath it. So uh, goods and bads from hot composting. Now, the reaction that is generating energy is what we would call exothermic. And so we have to talk about uh, the laws of thermodynamics, which is um, not the most exciting thing, but they are very important. And the easiest way we can determine whether or not a reaction is possible is by looking at its delta G naught. So delta G naught. Delta G naught is the sum of energy products minus the sum of energy of reactants. And we'll get into that, what that means in a second. But the assumptions you make here is a pH of 7, so a neutral pH, 25 degrees, so room temperature, and at a concentration of 1 molar. So this is the assumptions we make. Now, if delta G naught is negative, the reaction will proceed spontaneously, meaning that the reaction will happen. If delta G naught is positive, then the reaction will not proceed spontaneously, i.e. it won't go from start to finish. So that's, that's the framework we're going to use to talk about whether or not reactions happen. And, and again, all of metabolism is reactions. So now we can look at energy favorable reactions to help build biomass in microbes. So we can look at the delta G here, it goes from zero to 3000, and we can look at growth in biomass in grams per mole. So as this goes up, so the idea being is that the greater delta G, the more biomass is produced per mole of reactant. Now the idea being here, as we go up, as we increase the amount of delta G, as you can see, we increase the amount of biomass. Now let's go back to our little thing here. Delta G is negative, the reaction proceeds spontaneously. Delta G is po G not is positive, it won't proceed spontaneously. Now, what we can do is look at the carbon source. So we have a bunch of different carbon sources, and then we have a bunch of different oxidants. So oxygen, nitrate, and not nothing for ethanol. This is, would be fermentation. Now, what you'll notice is we can calculate delta G, and we can see delta G is very, very negative for glucose and oxygen. And it's still negative for ethanol, but it's much, much larger than that, right? So negative 14 is larger than negative 2,800. This is a weird um, graph because it starts at zero and it goes that way. And you would imagine this is like zero to 3,000, but it's zero to negative 3,000. So the reaction between glucose and oxygen is a very favorable one because that delta G um, is much lower, meaning the reaction will proceed, proceed spontaneously. But you, so you see that with glucose and oxygen and a bunch of different carbon sources, the delta G gets smaller and you're producing less overall biomass. And so that, that's delta G naught. And so delta G naught is calculated under ideal conditions. And is this realistic for microbes? And the answer to that obviously should be no, right? Microbes living on, in the ocean, they're not at 37 degrees. They're not at a pH of seven, right? They're not at ideal conditions. So delta G naught is not the best thing. However, delta G is, takes into account the actual concentrations of reactions and products. So the idea being, 
we can have for any equation or chemical reaction, we react A with B, so glucose with oxygen, to produce some byproduct C and D. Now, the math that goes into this to calculate delta G, which is, again, similar to delta G naught, but just slightly off, you take the delta G value of this equation, I'm sorry, the delta G naught value of this equation, add 2.3, multiply it by RT times log of the concentrations of C and D divided by the concentrations of A and B. So let's talk, um, let's talk a little bit about this. So the important thing here is not this RT value. We're not going to discuss what that is. The important thing here is this end part, because the end part is really important. Um, and the idea being is um, the concentration matters. As you increase the concentrations of the products or the reactants, it changes the value. So as you produce more products, this changes the value. As you produce, as you, as you have more reactants, it changes the value. So concentration matters. And so it might not be ideal conditions like we see with delta G naught, but delta G is a great way to assess whether or not a reaction is going to proceed or not. And again, it takes into account the concentration of the reactions. Um, and uh, just as a note, you can um, start to calculate some of these things. So the effect of concentration on ratio on the delta G. So if you look at the initial ratio of products to reactions, so that's, that's C, o, C times D divided by A divided by B, as that goes from very small to very large, you can look at the change in delta G. So the change in delta G is very, very small. And then it starts to go to very, very, to much larger. I shouldn't say very, very large. But the idea being is as you increase the amount of products, so the C and D, math tells us that that should increase, I'm sorry, that should decrease delta G, thus making the reaction more favorable. Because the idea being, if a reaction is very favorable, you should have more products than reactants. Um, and just as a note, um, a delta G not at plus 20, typically reactions won't proceed overall. Um, however, we can look at uh, potentially pairing things, right? Uh, we have a delta G of plus 20 and one of minus 30. And we have a, a overall delta G of minus 10. Well, that means the reaction will proceed. And um, what do I mean by this? Well, again, if I'm pairing delta Gs, what the heck do I mean? Well, microbials, microbial populations form what is called syntropy. And syntropy is a really fascinating um, area of microbiology, at least for me it is. Maybe not for you, but it definitely is inside your mouth, just as a note. Your, your dental microbiome is all about syntropy. Just as a note. Now, it's kind of a cool thing. We have two bacteria, Syntropus and Disulfo Vibrio. Now, they live together in, in, in environments that typically lack oxygen. And Syntropus takes this chemical benzoate, which is a common component of, of oil. And what it does, it catabolizes benzoate to acetate with this reaction. So it create, takes benzoate and water, creates acetate, bicarbonate, some protons, and some hydrogen gas. That if you calculate the delta G naught of this, it's plus 70. And remember, anything with anything that has a delta G naught greater than plus 20, it means the reaction won't proceed spontaneously, i.e. won't happen. However, when the, the syntropis lives with our friend, the solvovibrio, well, to sulfovibrio takes that hydrogen gas, con combines it with sulfate and a proton, and makes hydrogen, um, hydrogen. Fifty-two, we get a delta G of about eighty minus eighty-two. And remember, anything that has a delta G less than minus twenty will proceed spontaneously. So, living together, while this benzoate reaction is not particularly beneficial for syntropis, by coupling it in a syntropy with our disulfovibrio, it then becomes a beneficial reaction. So, we can use this interaction. We can use delta Gs to do something that actually is relatively important. In this case clean up oil. Uh, so as we saw above, 
when we're thinking about a symbiosis or two organisms living together, energetics can be a really key component of that symbiosis. Now, both members of a symbiosis, when they're sharing you know, energy, um, they typically both benefit. One, one, one typically gets the substrate that it needs, and the other gets a more favorable reaction. And much of this relationship of symbiosis and the exchanging of substrates, you know, in this case, we have hydrogen um, and, and, and it's many, many other instances other, elsewhere in the planet, but this can actually help shape the ecology and the geography of microbes in many ecosystems. So Delta G matters and so do the relative concentrations of reactions. But the question we need to know is not so much this chemistry part, is how do we make ATP, right? Just to go back to this figure, right? We have an organism taking this, doing some stuff, right? On the domain, so it's slightly different between archaea and bacteria and 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 uh, eukaryotes, but it has the same overall structure. This this the same thing, and we'll explain how this works. But think of it as like a propeller; it spins. Now, in this image, our blue parts rotate, and our red orange parts are stationary. So it spins again, like a fan. As I mentioned, it is similar across domains in life which is something that makes sense for bacteria and eukaryo. Um, this, this enzyme in particular for our back, or for, I'm sorry, for our key, uh, I'm sorry, for our eukaryo. ancestor of all three domains. And we could look at the overall structure. This is bacteria and eukaryotes, and this is what it looks like in our archaea. Not too different, right? Archaea have some other things. They have this yellow piece and this extra purple piece. But otherwise, it's pretty dang similar, both vertically from above as well as from the side view. So it's pretty overall similar. Now, you might be asking yourself, how do I use ATP synthase? Well, it all starts with proton gradients. Uh, because in chemistry, gradients do work. And when we think about work, all work is is the capacity to do something. And that could be anything. It could be breaking down a sugar. It could be moving, right? It could be talking, right? That's what work is, doing something. But as you build up a gradient, in particular of protons, you store what's called potential energy. And the analogy I'll give you to this is that water behind a dam. As you store water up behind a dam, that water has potential energy. And that potential energy is the capacity to flow over that dam, spin a turbine, and thus generate energy. And proton gradients work the exact same way. You build up protons in one side of a membrane, and you allow them to flow through your ATP synthase, and you generate energy along the way. And this gradient of protons is what we call proton motive force. And you might recall proton motive force for when we talked about motility in bacteria. Um, because proton modem force is what drives the fl flagellar movement in our little microscopic friends. But ultimately, proton motive force creates a charge and a chemical gradient, and this drives protons into the cell. And if you want to know how a dam works, this is just kind of a nice diagram of how a dam works. But ultimately, our chemotropes make ATP and stores energy via hydrogen gradients. Now, um, we're going to walk through this, this sort of step by step, but ultimately, the idea being is, is we transport hydrogen across the membrane and the cell wall, but most of this case, the cell wall. And, we and once we build up a strong enough gradient, we allow that gradient to flow back through ATP synthase. ATP synthase spins like a, a hydroelectric dam. And as it's doing that, it generates energy. And as it generates energy, it phosphorylates ADP into ATP. So that's how this, that's the sort of the basics of it. If you don't remember anything about what we're going to talk about, that's probably the most important thing to remember. So as I mentioned, proton motor force is used directly for cellular activities, including flagellar rotation and pushing ions in and out of the cell. And so when you're moving atoms, I'm sorry, when you're moving um, 
molecules went in the same direction as the proton moves. This is what we call symport. If you're moving all molecules in the exact opposite, the way the protons are moving, it's called antiport. So in this case, we're using um, symport to move something that is A minus along the, the same gradient as the proton. And then antiport is we're pumping a proton out to move a sodium ion in. But as I mentioned, these proton gradients also make ATP, and they do it by making AD, by using ATP synthase to rotate it and make phosphorylating ADP to ATP. Now, where does this occur? Well, in the mitochondria, so inside your cells, it occurs in what's called the intermembrane space. But what we care about is our bacteria and archaea, and this occurs in our periplasm. Now, as a refresher, what the heck is the periplasm? Well, the periplasm is the space between membranes. That's it. So in the case here, um, in our grand negatives, it's, there's no cell wall here. I, I apologize for that. But we see the periplasmic spaces between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And the periplasmic space here is going to be between that thick cell wall and the inner cellular membrane on our grand positives. And it's similar for archaea as well. Now, ATP is made by ATP synthase, and that's powered by our proton gradients. So how do we form a proton gradient? And the answer to this question is actually relatively, well, not really relatively simple, but it's a really easy sentence to say, and this is the electron transport system in a series of what we call oxidation reduction reactions. So what we're going to talk about now, you've probably heard of this oxidative phosphorylation, and this is what we're going to be talking about now electron transport systems, and oxidation reduction reactions. Now, oxidation re reduction reactions, or redox reaction, are generated by oxidizing one compound and reducing another. And what, is, what do I mean by that? Well, we have a compound, compound A, that has a couple extra electrons. What, and then we have a compound B that doesn't have any extra electrons. So compound B is oxidized, compound A is reduced. And all that happens is uh, compound A transfers its electrons to compound B, thus reducing compound B and oxidizing compound A. So in this case, when we pair the reduction of one with the oxidation of another, we have a redox reaction or an oxidation reduction reaction. So remember, if you're, if you're, if you're giving up electrons, you're becoming oxidized. If you're accepting electrons, you're becoming reduced. Now, the electron transport system, or ETS for short, is a transmembrane protein system that shuttles electrons from one protein to the next. The electrons go from a high energy donor to a low energy acceptor. In a sense, what they're doing is flowing down an energy gradient from high to low. Uh, a very high energy molecule, such as NADH. Now, NADH is one of several high energy molecules that bacteria and eukaryotes and archaea use. But the idea being is NADH will donate an electron uh, to what we would, to a series of proteins here on the membrane, and it becomes because it's donating electron, it becomes oxidized to NAD. It also produces two free hydrogen ions or protons. So H plus is just a proton. I don't know if I've said that before, but H plus is just a proton. Now, it donates electrons, and these electrons um, are then passed to what we call a quinone. And as it passes it from this protein structure to quinone, it pumps protons across the membrane into the periplasmic space. And then what ends up happening is as we, we pass this electron from quinone to quinone to quinone to quinone, and eventually we start pumping hydrogen ions across the system. Eventually we release another um, type of protein, which we'll talk about very shortly. It's a
plus two hydrogens from an organic product of catabolism. So in this back product here, it's designated as RH2. So this is, um, we're getting like a, 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 the catabolism, the organic product would be like a sugar or a fat. She doesn't know. Now, NADH then gets oxidized, donating its electrons to NADH dehydrogenase. And so in this case, this yellow protein here is NADH dehydrogenase or NADH1. Um, that then transfers to electrons. These all get transferred to what we call flavoproteins, which is um, which is sort of in here. It's not really depicted here. I, you know, I like this figure, but it doesn't have everything we need. It gets transferred to a flavoprotein, which is FA. electrons, it does pump two protons across the membrane, and it does this via a slight shift in the shape of the, the, the structure of the protein. And so we can look at what I just said. The idea being is we have we start off with NADH getting electrons. It donates those electrons to our, um, oh my goodness, I just completely forgot the name, uh, NADH dehydrogenase, which then transfers it to are Fe iron centers. And then as it, as it sort of transfers the electrons to the next pool, it pumps protons across the membrane into the periplasma. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. Now, to prepare to see more electrons, that iron sulfur protein transfers the electrons it currently holds to quinone. So in this case, it's gonna, this keeps going. It keeps transferring electrons into the system. But this cluster, the center here, has to get rid of those electrons to absorb more electrons. So it transfers it to these pool of quinols. Now, each quinone can accept two electrons and two protons. So it picks up more protons from the cytoplasmic membrane side of the membrane. Uh, I'm sorry, the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. <laughs> sorry about that. And the quinones themselves interact with a protein that can only handle two electrons. This is what we call a cytochrome. And so uh, in this sort of global process, the cytochrome is down here. So the, the quinones themselves hold two protons, two electrons, but they keep passing themselves until they interact with this cytochrome down at the end. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, because um, it can only handle two electrons, and eventually the cytochrome pumps protons outside of the cell. Now, to strip electrons, it in, the cytochrome itself interacts with an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase. And this enzyme takes the electrons, which oxidizes the cytochrome, and then transfer them to what we call a terminal electron acceptor, which in this very simple case we're gonna talk about is oxygen. So let's go over this process. Now, we started off by dumping electrons from NADH, into our proteins here, NADH dehydrogenase to those, those iron sulfur complexes, pumping protons, eventually passing them to a pool of quinones. Now, by the time we get to the end, these cytochrome oxidases, um, <clears throat> we need to donate those electrons somewhere. We have to reduce the cytochrome oxidase. And the way this happens is we consume oxygen to accept those electrons. And in the process, we consume oxygen, we consume hydrogen, and we produce water. But we use that again to pump oxygen, I'm sorry, to pump hydrogen across the gradient to again create more proton motor force. Now, again, this oxygen is what we call the terminal electron sector because again, these, these electrons are going through the system. They're being transferred over and over again. And the final acceptor is oxygen. Now, it's important that you remember that oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor because when we talk about alternative metabolisms very shortly, you're going to need to remember that the alternative electron acceptor is going to be different depending on uh, the metabolism we're talking about. Uh, but what we're talking about right now is oxidative or aerobic respiration. And now we can look at um, the redox potentials and the energy degraded generated, but we're just going to sort of skip over this and just focus on mostly on the process itself. Now, 
I will say oxygen is the best terminal electron acceptor, and we, we discussed this briefly before. So when oxygen is available, it is preferentially used. And so we can actually see this in real life. So sometimes when there, there is so much oxygen, I'm sorry, when there's so much nutrients and organisms are going crazy, sometimes they'll consume all the oxygen in a large stretch of the area. And so uh, what ends up happening to hypoxia and anoxia. And you can imagine if you use up all the oxygen in the ocean in a small spot, well, this might kill animals. And in fact, actually that's what happens. It kills fish and crabs and uh, they, they're, they're not too happy, right? This isn't good for the fishing industry in these areas that go oxygen free or hypoxic. And, uh, but the, the cool thing is that microbes do just fine. And you might ask yourself, well, how do they do this? And the answer to this is instead of using oxygen down here, they switch to an alternative electron acceptor. And that's gonna be the, the topic for our second part of the class, but let's summarize part two uh, before we move on. So delta G is an important uh, process, but microbes can break the basic rules of thermodynamics using centropy. So the example we used is the consumption of benzene um, in between two microbes to break down oil. Uh, ATP itself is generated by the enzyme ATP synthase, which is remarkably similar among microbes. And it again is all used to power proton motive force. And the proton motive force itself is generated by the electron transport system that pushes protons across the membrane using an energy of a redox reaction. And remember, we talked about aerobic respiration, which used oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor. But now we're going to um, we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about alternative metabolisms in part two of this energetics lecture. If you didn't like part one of energetics, you're probably not going to like part two as well. Just saying. So the questions we're going to try to answer of energetics part two is how do microbes generate the energy using substrates other than glucose and oxygen? How can we use electron towers to figure out energy gains and predict possible metabolic strategies? And what are some interesting uses of alternative microbial metabolisms? So as we men I mentioned in the first class, compared to macroscopic organisms, microbes have considerable mac uh, metabolic diversity and flexibility. And unlike us, microbes have the capacity to use many, many different substrates as both electron donors and electron acceptors in their electronic transport genes. And historically speaking, we actually use this um, you know, flexibility of microbes to identify them. So it is useful. And the cool thing is that even if you have one organism, it can have multiple pathways. And if a microbe has multiple pathways, and we'll talk about some of these pathways, it is deemed what we call a mixotrope, meaning it can use multiple different pathways to get energy. So microbes have all sorts of crazy metabolisms that they can use relative to us. We're very, very, very simple. Eukaryotes are very, very simple where we get our energy from. But microbes, they can use all sorts of crazy things. Now, the question we should ask ourselves before we move on is, where does all this metabolic diversity come from? And it really comes from the electron tower. And so in red, we have the electron acceptor. And in blue, we have the electron donor. And what these are, are standard reduction potentials. So what we're doing is we're taking an acceptor, right? That's gonna be the final product of the electron transport chain. So like oxygen is what we talked about in the previous section. And then we have an electron donor. So where are we getting those original from? So just as a, just to reiterate, the electron donor back here was RH2, which donated it to NADH. That's what we're referring to in terms of electron donor. Now, the, the way this is set up is as you move from the top to the bottom, you move from CO2 all the way down to oxygen. You move from a bad electron acceptor to a good electron acceptor. And as you move from the bottom of the blue part up to the top, you move from a bad electron donor to a good electron donor. And what you want to do in this tower is pair something that's a good electron donor with something that's a good electron acceptor. Because the greater the change in these, delt, these E naught values, the more energy you get out. So as you'll notice from this tower, the best way to get the most energy is pairing oxygen 
with sugar. And that is, in fact, the best way to get energy. Fun, fun stuff. So the goal, as I mentioned, is to pair a strong electron donor with a strong electron acceptor. And the, like, as I mentioned, the best way is oxygen plus glucose. And the, the energy yield of the reaction, so how much energy the microbe gets, is the difference, right? So if I pair glucose with oxygen, so plus 820 with minus 430, if I do that math, 820. from the acceptor. So you, uh, the, in terms of this equation, it's always acceptor on the left, donor on the right. So pretty handy way, right? So if we were to try to do this any other way, right, we could pretend to do the worst electron donors, and the worst electron acceptors. If we paired um, CO2 with water, it would be negative 430 plus 820, giving us, you know, an overall of what, uh, 200 millivolts, so not particularly great. So you're trying to maximize your potential. You're trying to keep these as far apart as possible as you can. So now we talked about, um, you know, trophic lifestyles, trophic groups. Now we talked about, you know, just oxygen based metabolisms, but to get into more complex metabolisms of bacteria, we have to sort of introduce some more trophic groups. And these trophic groups uh, are further divided by where they get their electrons from. You can either get your electrons from inorganic molecules or organic molecules. If you get them from inorganic molecules, you are considered a lithotroph. about they're all basically using a slight variation of this electron transport system that we talked about so in this case in the previous part of this lecture we talked about this exact same pathway but we used uh, carbon here as an electron acceptor I'm sorry electron donor and oxygen as an electron acceptor and so but all electron transport systems whether it uses oxygen or not whether it uses chemotrophy or lithotrophy all of them have very similar features. So we start off with the substrate, which is the initial initial donor, which in this case is going to be the RH2. And it has what we associate, an associated enzyme, which is called an oxidioreductase. Then we have a pool of quinones. And then we have a terminal or final electron acceptor, and then another oxidioreductase. Just as a note, when I say oxidioreductase, these are just, these are just enzymes. That's all they are. So let's talk about aerobic metabolisms first. <clears throat> now, these, these are metabolisms that require oxygen because oxygen is the best biologically relevant electron acceptor. And it, it does yield the most amount of energy from redox reactions. Because remember, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to oxidize something and reduce something else. And oxygen is pretty cool. It can oxidize a lot of different molecules, which means it's very quick in the efficient form of respiration. And we can sort of just look at, um, you know, some of these pairings, right? We can pair oxygen with a number of different things. So we have oxygen down here. We can pair with any number of different things above it. We can pair oxygen with almost anything, which is kind of cool. But we can also look at some different types of reactions. We can pair oxygen with hydrogen here. Uh, so we have uh, here in blue. So we have hydrogen plus oxygen gives us water with a delta G of negative 237, which means it's a particularly favorable reaction. We can rea look at reaction number two, where we pair hydrogen with nitrate, which gives us a delta G naught of minus 163. Or we can pair hydrogen with fumarate, so the black one here, hydrogen with fumarate, or succinate here, which gives us the delta G of minus 86. So you, as you can see, like the delta G on, again, the delta G not here is really negative for the oxygen relative to everything else. Because oxygen is just simply kind of the best. 
and it pairs with a lot of different things. Pretty much anything you can think of, it will pair with oxygen in terms of a redox reaction. Now, let's talk about our aerobic organotrophs. Now, as you can tell, it's aerobic, meaning oxygen, organotrophs, meaning we get our electrons from an organic or carbon-based source. So as you can imagine, organic carbon is the electron source and oxygen is the acceptor. As humans, we are aerobic organotrophs. We use the process of oxidative phosphorylation to generate energy in our cells. Now, our metabolism as a whole is limited to glucose as a fuels. Microbes can use a litany of carbon compounds, including lactose, lactate, sucrose, maltose, acetate, and very large organic molecules such as DDT. Now, our bacteria, archaea, and fungi can all exhibit pretty remarkable flexibility in their carbon sources, which makes them really good decomposers of organic matter in nature. But humans, uh, things that look like us, you know, not just primates, but animals, we really only can use glucose in our metabolism. So it's kind of a, kind of a bummer. Um, next up is organic or aerobic lithotrophs. Now, we saw organo is getting electrons from organic molecules. Lithos get things from inorganic compounds to supply their electrons. And again, as I mentioned, sulfur, iron, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Now, these are mostly autotrophic, and so they, they produce their own energy. They produce their own carbon. While they don't use light, they use chemicals to synthesize. So they do a, a form of metabolism called chemosynthesis as opposed to photosynthesis. And so they can live in very, very dark places that have lots of reduced compounds, such as hydrothermal vents. So let's talk about one process like this. Let's talk about one of my favorite metabolisms, which is actually nitrification. Now, nitrification itself is a two-step process. You first convert ammonia, NH3, to nitrite, which is NO2. And then you convert nitrite to nitrate, which is NO3. Each step of this process of nitrification is actually carried out by two different organisms. So first, we have ammonia oxidizers, which, ca which catalyze NH3 to NO2. This is characterized by bacteria and archaea. And then we have nitrosphera, which are archaea, which we find in soil. Then we have our nitrate oxidizers, which convert nitrite to nitrate. And these are done by a few groups of microbes, uh, nitrobacter, nitrosporina, nitrosococcus, and nitrospira. I always get nitrospina and nitrospira confused. Now, this is a process that requires oxygen. It needs oxygen and ammonia, and it produces um, nitrate as its byproduct. So we can look at this electron transport system. It's the same process. It, they, we get ammonia or nitrate to donate your electrons. They're passed down to generate energy. And they're passed down to a terminal electron acceptor. In this case, it's oxygen. Same overall process, just instead of NADH, we're using nitrogen-based compounds. Now, Kind of a cool thing about nitri nitrifying bacteria and nitrifying archaea is they're very slow glowers, growers. And you should ask yourself that question of why. And the fact is they just don't get a lot of energy from their redox reaction. So they pair oxygen with nitrite. Well, that delta G is not very big. I'm sorry, that delta, I'm sorry, that E naught is not very big, not relative to oxygen pairing with glucose. So they don't get a lot of energy from what they do, which means they're very, very slow growers. Fun. So next up is sulfur oxidation. Electron donors in this case is reduced sulfur. And reduced sulfur is typically HS, but can also be uh, elemental sulfur as well. So sulfide 
inorganic sulfur and thiosulfate are the primary electron donors that we're thinking about, with sulfide HS being the most common. I'm sorry, Vegetoa, Paracoccus, and Thiobacillus. These are, this is only a bacteria process. And this needs oxygen and sulfide. And so there's this, this is sort of what sulfur cycling looks like. And it's, there's a couple genes that are associated with it. Um, but let's talk about uh, our friend Vegetoa. Um, well, actually, let's, let's talk about it. Let me show you some pictures of Vegetoa. Because one of the cool things about Vegetoa that I just neglected to mention is um, they take this elemental sulfur and they convert it into stored sulfur globules. And it's actually kind of cool. So these are some pictures that my friend took, um, not this one, but this one, uh, of Vegetoa. And you can see all this white stuff in the sediments here and in the Vegetoa here. It's actually just those sulfur globules. So these bacteria produce sulfur globules so large, you can actually physically see them with the naked eye. So you can see this bacteria without a microscope. It is actually pretty cool. And you can see it under the microscope. You can see all these little globules of white sulfur here. So. Next up is iron oxidation. And so this is the oxidation of ferrous iron, or Fe2+. Now, in terms of um, our, uh, <clears throat> our, uh, the presence of iron, it's typically rapidly oxidized in the presence of, of atmospheric oxygen, as we talked about with those banded iron formations earlier in this class. But these bacteria do like to use iron in their metabolism. They do need oxygen. And what it does is it generalize, generalize the, generates oxidized or ferric iron, Fe3+. So this is the banded iron formations that we were talking about. And um, this is um, really, really heavily dependent on the environment. So if it's going to happen, um, the environment either needs to happen at very, very low pHs, or it happens, it needs to happen in the absence of oxygen. Um, so it's not a particularly uh, common metabolism because it's very specific, but it's still a thing. But again, it does typically, if it's going to be in, done in the presence of oxygen, such as in a very, a very low pH, it needs oxygen. Um, otherwise, it's done in the absence of oxygen. Now, <clears throat> Uh, all of our redox pairs thus far have involved oxygen, right? We've talked about nitrification, we've talked about iron oxidation, but we've all, we've, all these have involved the use of oxygen in some shape or form. And remember, using oxygen as the electron acceptor is the best electron acceptor you can do. You can generate the most energy. Now, in the case of nitrification, we were pairing it with something close to oxygen, so the delta E, I'm sorry, the E uh, not value here is not very good. But when you pair oxygen with something else, you still get a lot of energy. Now, that's our oxygen-based metabolisms. Let's go to the dark side of metabolism. Well, let's ask the question, what happens if we don't have oxygen? Well, this leads us to anaerobic metabolisms. And these, as it implies, are metabolisms that don't require oxygen. And in the, what they use, instead of using oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor, they respire or breathe nitrogen iron, sulfur, or they do a process called fermentation, which is uh, the tastiest of all the processes on the planet, because fermentation is what makes beer and bread and wine and all the, the good stuff in life. Now, this is, this is a necessity for life in anaerobic environments. This includes very deep down in the ocean, inside your own gut, in waterlogged soils and sediments. And if we think about early life on Earth, anaerobic-based metabolisms would have been the first to evolve. Because remember, early Earth had no oxygen. So anaerobic metabolisms are the first uh, metabolisms. Now, these alternative electron acceptors, nitrogen, iron, and sulfur, or fermentation, they're not as energetically favorable or energetically awesome, as I say here, as oxygen, which means they can't oxidize as many things, and they're less efficient, and they oftentimes lead to incomplete decomposition. And organisms just don't get as much energy by using these alternative electron acceptors in their anaerobic metabolisms. So the first one we're going to talk about is our friend fermentation. 
Now, in the process of fermentation, organic carbon is reduced. So there is no electron transport system, and there's no generation of proton motor force. And so we could talk about, in particular, a couple different types of bacteria, um, including the lactic acid bacteria. And so if you like uh, sauerkraut, if you like yogurt, um, this is a process that will be of great interest to you, or, or even something like kimchi or kombucha. This is a process that will be of great interest to you. But these lactic acid bacteria, they thrive in very low in low oxygen and pH environment. They may Um, NADH, and they take pyruvate, which is the end product of fermentation, and they essentially use that pyruvate to reject to make lactate or lactic acid. So this is what we call lactic acid fermentation. So we're taking glucose, we're generating ATP via glycolysis, and then we're making taking that pyruvate and then essentially fermenting it into lactic acid or lactate. And as I mentioned, this makes cheese. And so the fermentation of cheese, in particular, in this case, Swiss cheese, actually involves a, a two-step fermentation process, which is kind of cool. Now, the way this works is we have lactobacillus salvelicus and streptococcus salvarius. So they're two lactic acid bacteria. They take the lactose in cheese and they ferment it, or they break it, I'm sorry, they break it down into glucose and galactose. And once they break it down into glucose and galactose, they then stick it into lactic acid fermentation. So they stick it into this process. Now, once they produce that lactate, we have another bacteria, Propionibacterium, um, not, I can never remember how to say this microbe's name. What it does is it takes that lactate and ferments it into propionate, which gives it the Swiss type flavor. And then it makes acetate and CO2 plus energy and some other stuff. Um, but the, the production of CO2 is actually what gets Swiss cheese, it's little eyes. So the fermentation of, um, um, the fermentation of lactose um, into lactate is then fermented into propionate and giving Swiss cheese its flavor and its eyes. So if you ever wonder how Swiss cheese is made, this is how it's made, kind of a fun process. Now, uh, fermentation doesn't have to be lactic acid based. It can also be um, uh, ethanol based. And so for those of you that like beer and wine, ethanol production in terms of that process is made via, al uh, uh, I'm sorry, ethanolic based fermentation. So this is very similar as you can see from the diagram on the right, but at the end product, it's not lactic acid or lactate, it's ethanol. And so it's, as you can notice, it's almost the same process, right? You use glycolysis, to make to take glucose to make a little bit of ATP um, and to make pyruvate that pyruvate is then converted into CO2 uh, and then acetaldehyde and that acetaldehyde is then converted into ethanol um, and this is this is ethanolic fermentation um, so this is done in the absence of oxygen um, and it needs lots and lots of glucose for it to do its thing but the end product, again, is, is typically an alcohol. It doesn't have to be ethanol. It can also be methanol. It can also be acetate. It can be any number of things. And it's actually kind of cool. Uh, one of the things we see in nature is if the end product is not ethanol, but it's acetate, that acetate is then used by other types of microbes, such as denitrifying bacteria, which we'll talk about very shortly, in their metabolism. So these are our two different types of fermentation, ethanolic and lactic acid-based fermentation. But again, you can, as you can see, they're very, very similar processes but they require lots and lots of glucose and they produce very little energy overall. And so uh, eukaryotes such as us and including yeast and fungi are fermenters as well. And so we as humans ferment to lactic acid, but our eukaryotes, uh, in particular our yeast can ferment to uh, alcohol or many other compounds, but most commonly it's alcoholic based fermentation. And so we can look at some of the The energy you get from fermentation is so, so small relative to oxygen-based metabolism or even nitrogen-based metabolisms. So 
it's a really important process, both commercially as well as in nature, but it's just not a lot of energy out the back end. But again, it's anaerobic, so they don't really have any other choice. But if a bacteria can't use oxygen, its next favorite thing to use is typically nitrate. And this process of using nitrate is called denitrification. And this is a really important process globally. Um, this is actually one of the things I studied when I got my doctorate. So it's a process I really love and I love talking about it. So uh, denitrification requires organic carbon such as acetate for its electron source. And as I mentioned before, our denitrifiers typically get their acetate from fermenters. Now, our denitrifiers use nitrogen as that terminal electron scepters. Now, it's kind of a cool thing. Denitrification isn't, um, isn't like a one-step process. It's a multi-step process where you convert nitrate to nitrogen gas. And uh, we'll talk about this shortly, but uh, it is strictly anaerobic, so it requires essentially no oxygen or very, 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 very low oxygen. Now, the kind of the cool thing about denitrifying bacteria is that they are typically facultative, which means they prefer to use oxygen, but in the absence of oxygen, they will use switch to using nitrate. So let's talk about this process. And uh, it's a cool process. So it's again, it's, it's all about generating a proton gradient. Now, as you'll notice, there's a couple extra enzymes along the way. So this is a relatively specialized process relative to regular old garden variety based nitrogen, um, oxygen based metabolism. So the input is NADH and that NADH got its electrons from acetate or some other form of organic compound. And it's the same process. We transfer it to an oxidia reductase here and then to an iron sulfur core and then eventually to a pool of quinones. But the interesting thing here is that pool of quinones then passes it to a cytochrome and then eventually to what we call a nitrate reductase. And there's a couple of nitrate reductates along the way. Nitrate reductase where we convert NO3 to NO2, and then there's another one where we convert NO2 to NO, and then there's another that converts NO to N2O, and then N2O in the final step is converted to N2 gas. So it's a much more complex process because there's a bunch of different steps, but the process is still the same. We're transferring electron pumping protons across the gradient to eventually we can pump things, but eventually we can use ATP synthase to generate energy. Now, as I mentioned, this is a process that's done anaerobically. It incurs in both terrestrial and marine environments. It's preferred by a diverse cast of bacteria and archaea. And there's well over 50 genera that have been described to perform denitrification, including some that you've seen in the lab, including Pseudomonas and Bacillus. Now, typically speaking, uh, when we look at a microbial community in soil, sediment, or water, 10 to 15% have the capacity or the, the molecular machinery to perform denitrification as a process. So denitrification is a really cool process that's really important. It has a huge effects on ecosystems worldwide. Another really important metabolism is actually sulfate reduction. So they reduce sulfate to hydrogen sulfide, H2S, and that's the terminal electron acceptor. And these have variable sources of electrons. So those sulfate reducers that are organotrophs, they use small reduced organic compounds, um, typically from fermentation, including lactate, acetate, carbohydrates, methanol, ethanol, methane, benzene, and so on and so forth. And that's in contrast to lithotrophs, which use hydrogen gas as their electron source. And uh, just as a note, uh, when sulfate reducers are in environments, they do compete with other um, organisms that are trying to use hydrogen in their metabolism. And this includes methanogens, which we'll talk about later. Now, unlike denitrification, which generates a eat more, right? Pretend if you're like, uh, you know, you're eating like a, like a salad, right? You don't get a lot of energy from salad. So you have to eat more salad relative to say something that's very energy intensive, such as a burger. Um, now, um, when we're looking at marine environments, uh, it's actually kind of interesting because sulfate reduction actually represents the majority of heterotrophic microbial growth in marine environments. And if you've ever been down to the beach and it smells kind of eggy, at, and kind of hydrogen sulfide at low tide, 
Well, it's all because of sulfate reducing bacteria. So let's, uh, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. So in this, this example we have, this is from a deep sea chimney. So hydrogen gas is the electronic source and H2S is sulfide. So um, I'll just make, just make a note before we sort of talk about this. Most sulfate reducing are what we call delta proteobacteria and they fall in these orders of microbes. But ultimately, very much like denitrification, it's a stepwise process where we convert sulfate to APS and to SO3 and to elemental sulfur. And along the way, we're pumping protons across the gradient. There's electron machinery, there's, elect um, there's enzymatic machinery along the way doing it. And again, the terminal electron acceptor here is gonna be S elemental sulfur here. And um, we, can look at, uh, we can look at this electron tower. So you can see sulfate itself, SO4 is at the very top of the electron tower. And which implies is that it's um, got a pretty high energy yield. So how does this work? Well, um, these organisms actually convert sulfate to APS, adenosine 5-phosphosulfate, which is about here, which has an E value, E of negative 60. And so this does require some energy to do it. But this is what it works like. They convert sulfate to APS, takes a little bit of energy, APS to sulfite, and then sulfite to hydrogen sulfide. Um, and this is, again, strictly anaerobic, needs sulfate, needs organic compound that's reduced. And not, again, not a ton of energy, but it gets the job done, right? And I'll just make a note, if you're pairing sulfate to methanol, not a very big jump in energy here. But if you, if you convert that sulfate to something else, well, then you can pair it with something and get slightly more energy. So next up is iron reduction. And we've slightly talked about iron reduction already, but it uses oxidized or ferric iron, Fe3+, as an electron acceptor and generates ferrous iron, Fe2+. And this uses organic carbon or even hydrogen as an electron source. And it has, and this is actually, um, in terms of uh, metabolic strategies, we think this might be one of the actual first metabolisms um, that evolved. Iron's really abundant. Um, and it's really, really energy efficient to get. Uh, now, lots of, early earth before oxygenation happened, lots of iron, lots of sulfur. And this is um, a metabolism we observe in both archaea and bacteria. So we think this is a really good um, way to get uh, energy. And it's a very old way of getting energy. Now, there are two different methods to oxidize um, <clears throat> iron. You can either do it like Shewanella does or Geobacter. Now, Shewanella is a marine organism. It does this really cool, um, uh, behavior where it makes nanowires. Um, if you want to know what that looks like, just Google Shewanella and nanowires, and there's awesome videos about that. And then it's also done by Geobacter, which is found in soils and aquatic habitats. Now, I don't want to dive too much into iron oxidation because it's, you know, it's an old metabolism, but um, there are, as you can see, there there is clear differences for how this is done between the two. And as I mentioned, there are nanowires and nanowires are sound as cool as it sounds. It's little wires that are extended and they generate electrical current along the nanowires. So again, if you're that interested you at all, I like, seriously just Google nanowires. Uh, Geobacter uh, as he is a kind of an interesting guy. It has the capacity to oxidize, I'm sorry, reduce uranium. So it, it oxidizes acetate and reduces uranium. So it reduces uranium to uranium six plus to uranium four plus. And this is the chemical reaction that occurs. So what they're doing is producing insoluble uranium bound to oxygen. And they're using uranium to make energy. Not the way we use uranium to make energy, but they're using uranium to make energy, which is just kind of a wild and sci-fi thing to do. And we actually use this to um, these microbes for bioremediation. So we use them in the Colorado River to clean up uranium from the nuclear tests all those years ago. Fun stuff. Now, uh, the next, the one of the sort of the final processes we're going to talk about here is actually methanogenesis. Now, methanogenesis is the oxidation of acetic acid or carbon dioxide as the terminal electron acceptor. The hydro hydrogen is going to be the electron source here, and the end product of this, as you can tell by its name, is methane. So this process oxidizes acetic acid or CO2 and uses hydrogen as an electron source or electron donor. 
Now, this is a distinctly archaeal strategy. So as far as we know, only archaea are capable of performing methanogenesis. Now, unlike some of the other metabolisms that we talked about, methanogenesis is strictly anaerobic. Any methanogen, so the microbes that carry out methanogenesis, that is exposed to oxygen, they die really, really quickly. So they have to always be in anaerobic environments. And these typically include like wetland sediments inside the guts of, you know, like cows and humans and termites, or in extreme environments such as like deep inside rocks or at hydrothermal vents. Um, and so this is a kind of interesting process. Now, it is a pretty complicated pathway. So we're not going to dive too deep into this, but it does generate sodium, a sodium gradient too. Um, and so it uses not just the hydrogen gradient, but also a sodium gradient to power its ATP synthase. But again, it, it's anaerobic. It needs CO2 or acetic acid and hydrogen for its metabolism. And so just to summarize the final part, microbes can use many different electron sources and donors in their electron transport systems, but the idea remains the same. Donate an electron from something, whether it's an inorganic compound like nitrogen or sulfur, or an organic compound such as glucose or alcohol, and you pass the electrons down a transport system to an electron acceptor. And this electron acceptor can be oxygen, it could be nitrogen, it could be any number of different things. But metabolisms themselves are split between aerobic versus anaerobic and organotrophic versus lithotrophic. And the diversity of metabolic strategies is pretty useful. And we'll talk about some metabolic pairings in the next couple of lectures, but the metabolic needs of microbes play a pretty big role in their ecology and their biogeography. So, with that, that's going to wrap up this part of this, well, not this part, but this lecture itself. Please let me know if you have any questions. I hope you uh, aren't completely bored by all this chemistry stuff. I realize this isn't for everyone, but it is important for understanding the ecology of microbes. So if you have any questions, please let me know. But otherwise, I hope you guys have a great day and take care.